with the red on the top, that one. That one, that's the camera, that's the one. I, and the camera should be looking at Peter McGinnis Mark. He's right there, that's, he's our special guest. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about research in motion in Manoa. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Comes out of the um, Hawaii Institute of Ge Geo uh, Geophysics and Planetology. Very good. And Peter has been there since 1921. Not quite true, uh, 1982. <laughs> okay. So, been there 33 years. Yeah. 33. You know, I mean, the more I, the more I see and talk to people at HIGP, the more impressed I am. It's a, a very senior organization, but it's also got a lot of innovation you going on. You just can't get rid of us. That's the main <laughs> problem. <guess so. laughs> it seems to be one of the strongest scientific elements in the university. Disagree if you like. Uh, the the host organization which is the school of ocean earth science and technology really is the sort of the flagship research endeavor on the campus there are other places that are exceptional like the institute for astronomy for example but sost brings in about a third of the university's research dollars right. every year and so my institute is one of three research institutes and four academic departments and a few other small groups which are run a really big research endeavor um, for the whole campus. Why is that? More effort or are you more in the mainstream? Um, primarily, we are, I think, so successful because Hawaii is a wonderful place to do the kind of research that we're interested in. So, for example, if you're interested in active volcanoes, Hawaii is uh, a really good place not only to do basic research but to train students. If you're interested in deep water oceanography, which is sort of surrounding the, the Hawaiian Islands, then you need research vessels, you need manned submersibles, you develop instruments to go down to the ocean floor. If you are interested in astronomy, um, with the Institute for Astronomy, Mauna Kea and Haleakala are the premier places to do all here. astronomy. It's all here. It's all here. So everybody gravitates uh, to this locality, and it also makes it really um, much easier if you're trying to compete for research funding. Because they know, they, they this know is where the action is. This is where the action is. So yeah. you've got about a 30 to 40 year heritage of people doing successful research in some of these fields, and it's sort of its success be, builds on success, quite honestly. Yeah. So if you had to, if you had to, you know, if you had to say what the sea change has been, that's not the right word to use with a geologist, but um, what the sea change has been in terms of the movement of your science, it would be that you have better tools now, right? Or is there more than that? Um, my particular field, which is planetary geology and sort of exploring the solar system, um, the, the real sea change has been the university's increasing interest in building the instruments that would make increasingly more sophisticated measurements of the planets. Um, we're starting to compete, say, with uh, putting our own instruments on spacecraft. But first and foremost, we've trained maybe 10 graduate students who've subsequently gone on to other universities or government labs, all of whom have built instruments which are now either on the surface of Mars or orbiting Saturn. That's exciting. And so the technology side of how do you make measurements of the planets has really, um, no pun intended, taken off, perhaps, <laughs> say, in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah. So it's that integration of what kind of science do you want to do, how do you make the measurements, and what do you do in terms of mission design or um, analyzing the data and that sort of thing. So two things uh, spin off of that for me uh, I wanted to ask you. So <clears throat> when you need an instrument, you know what you need because you're doing the research. You, you have... You, you don't want somebody else to figure that out because you know best, right? Well, you, you have sort of um, a basic idea of what kind of data you need. You, you know, say, what level of detail do you need if you're studying the surface of the planet. You know what wavelengths you need to make the measurements. You know what accuracy you need. If, say, you're searching for the difference between two different minerals on the surface of the planet. You, you know from sort of physics what the quality of the instrument has to be in order to say there's olivine or there's a granite or the, something like that on the ground. 
So you can do fairly well with the basic uh, capability of the instrument. And then you have the other side of the coin. You need to know, well, how big an instrument do you need to build? Like if it's got a long optical telescope, for example, you can't put it on a shoebox size spacecraft. Um, and then also, you have to be concerned about how much data is this instrument going to be collecting. If, for example, you go out to Pluto, and I hope sometime we'll, today we'll see a picture of Pluto, yeah. the spacecraft that has been making all these amazing discoveries is called New Horizons. Um, that spacecraft sends back its images at 64 kilobits per second. So if you had an old dial-up modem, <laughs> the older people will know about dial-up modem. <laughs> It'd take forever. <laughs> New Horizons is sending data back at about eight times slower than a dial-up modem. Oh. Okay, so you obviously don't want to have a highly detailed, and we've got now a, a wonderful picture of Pluto actually on the screen. Oh. And here what we're seeing, Jay, this is one of the closest approach images of the surface of Pluto. Um, on the left-hand side of the image, you're actually seeing mountains that are over about three kilometers high. Now, Pluto's 39 times the distance Earth is away from the sun, so it's at 39 astronomical units. And we were expecting the, the science community, I'm not on this uh, experimental team, we were expecting that it would be a dead world, you know, kind of like the moon or, or Mercury to see not only these mountains, which are way higher than we were expecting, but also lots of flat areas. And if we don't have the image today, but there are, there's evidence that the flat area has recently been mobile. So this is all methane ice, nitrogen ice. We're at a temperature at 40 Kelvin, all right? So room temperature, even though the studio is cold, room temperature right now is about 310 Kelvin. So it's quite warm here. Yeah. If you went to Antarctica, that's at about 250 Kelvin. So Pluto is really cool. super, super cold, right? Yeah. And to see the surface just moving around, or it's done so sometime in the past, is remarkable because Pluto's so far away from the sun that it doesn't get hit by any big objects. So how do they, how do things get molten? How do they, how does it get molten? Yeah. It's, it's a world, it's got a diameter of about 2,400 kilometers or so, about 1,600 miles. So it's about, it's a little bit smaller than our moon. So the inside should have frozen long time early in the solar system history. But it didn't. But it didn't. <laughs> and, and so these sorts of images are absolutely stunning. And you can sort of see, um, as we're looking over the limb or the edge of the world, uh, you've got some banding. It's even got an atmosphere. So the atmosphere extends way higher above the surface than Earth's atmosphere does, because the gravity is much lower. And so it's this kind of image that really sort of fires up all of the, 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 my colleagues in the community, simply because we see for the first time with some of these robot explorers, a totally new, new and alien world. The, yeah. things you the, never the, saw the geology yeah. is just radically different because the gravity is low, because the surface temperature is incredibly cold. You know, to think about rocks made of liquid methane or nitrogen and all, all these other things. We, we really haven't got any personal experience of what should be going on in the interior of Pluto in order to make the landscape which we've just seen. But the, but the interesting thing, and I keep stumbling on this one fact, is everything on Pluto, and for that matter, everything on every planet, in our solar system is on the periodic table of elements. Well, I mean, if you look elsewhere out into uh, our galaxy or in any other galaxy that the, the telescopes, either the Hubble or the Keck telescopes, for example, can find, yes, you, you see the same gambit of elements and all of the physical laws seem to be working in the same way that they do here. I mean, God set this up in an amazing way. 
it just works so well, not only here, but also elsewhere in the universe. Or you could say the, the inverse, that we are only physically present on this planet because that's the way it works. Yeah. All right, yeah. so this is the, uh, I mean, this is a philosophical or a religious debate on whether or not um, you know, we were created to actually see the world the way it is, or the only way we can observe it is if it works in a way that's beneficial. <laughs> but that, that's the sort of uh, philosophical debate that some astrophysicists would have, yeah. as opposed to a planetary geologist like myself. What's the difference between an astrophysicist and a planetary geologist? Um, I, I would love to go and kick some of the rocks with my boots, all right? like a geologist on the Earth. I would really like to go and walk on the surface of Mars. And we've got another image. Can we put on the image, um, I think it's called Mount Sharp, or it's a view of the Martian surface. And uh, here we go. Now look at, I mean, isn't this stunning? All oh, right, it just looks like Death Valley, or it looks part of Utah. But this is a mosaic taken from NASA's Curiosity rover, right? So we're looking at the inside of a giant hole in the ground called Gale Crater. And off in the distance, now we're about two kilometers away from the, the, the hills in the foreground. This is what a geologist would give the eye teeth for, all right? So that you can actually see um, a whole series of slow hills rising up to an elevation of about 10 kilometers. This, is, yeah, this peak is called Mount Sharp, okay. and it's very unusual. It's not unique on the planet, but there's only about three others. What is that white uh, zone in there? What is well, that? Well, some people hypothesize that it's dried up lake sediments. Um, the, the doubting Thomases, mainly those who aren't on the science team, think this is an unreasonable explanation simply because those bright layers are an elevation that is too high for right, them to lake be sediment. lake sediments. Because yeah. if they were lake sediments, the water would have spilled over the, the surrounding rim of the crater. Right? But you know, you're looking into a, a stack of layered rocks. They're probably sedimentary, but they could also be volcanic in origin. And really, a, a planetary geologist could only tell you definitively which one it is, whether it's sedimentary rocks, it could be lake sediments, or it could be wind-blown sediments. That's one idea. Or it could be volcanic ash that was laid down as a whole series of different layers. Yeah. All right? And even with the, the instruments that are currently on the Curiosity rover, we can't tell which one is which. And in all likelihood, the rover will be unable to drive high enough up Mount Sharp. It's steep? Uh, no, it's only about oh, 10 to 15 degrees. But um, the rover's moving quite slowly. It's moving probably, on a good day, it does about 50 meters, five zero meters. And that's on flat ground. Um, the guess is that it would take about another five years to get to where the, 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 the bright <laughs> It gives you an right, idea. To give you some idea. Involved, yeah. But a, a planetary geologist would just love to be there. Whereas an astrophysicist would love to have, say, um, high resolution views of uh, various galaxies in order to try and figure out, say, uh, you know, why do they hold together um, because we can't see enough of mass, there has to be dark matter somewhere within a, a swirling galaxy. Ex external to what we see in the picture. External to what we see in the picture. I yeah. mean, that's one of the, uh, as I understand it, the sort of the, the, the most pressing of questions an astronomer or an astrophysicist is faced with, is that you can't explain why galaxies hold themselves together when they're, they're spinning. The only way you can do that is that they are much more massive, so gravity is holding them together. But when you look at the number of stars that you can visibly see, there's an insufficient amount of mass to explain that. So trying to figure out what is dark matter, where is it, it, it 
you know, that, that's a pressing issue. To me, as a geologist, I don't care. I mean, as a layperson, right, I care. But here's the question. Can anything those guys do, the astrophysicists, anything that they, that they do or say or find impact you in your thinking on the geological level? Um, no. <laughs> probably not, because uh, most of the astronomers, they look out into the heavens much further away than Pluto. You know, they look often beyond the, the boundaries of our own galaxy. So they are looking much further back in time and to a, a time period way before our sun ignited, probably way before the, the, the previous generation of stars from which our sun and solar systems constructed were formed. So there's sort of a, a disconnect. We are coming at the same set of problems from two different time directions here. For me, an old rock is four billion years old, okay? That's about as old as you can find any rock here on the Earth. But for an astronomer who's looking, you know, perhaps eight to ten billion light years out um, at some distant galaxy, that, that's, that's the difference in time scale. Yeah. Um, I mean, time scale, we deal with this all the time. Yeah. We, do, we deal with this three times a show. We take one minute and we have a break. Okay. And that's what we're going to do now. What a deal. I don't know where that fits on the continuum here. Four billion, one minute. It fits in the refreshment break. <laughs> Peter McGinnis Mark, uh, researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. And I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding that science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests who are scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work, why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo, and you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. We'll start with probably that one. Okay, here we are. <laughs> Peter McGinnis Mark, uh, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology. That's S O E S T, SOEST. And he's the director of the NASA Pacific Regional Planetary Data Center and director of the UH Manoa Sustainability Initiative. I don't know what. Do, do you ever sleep? Oh, sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, question. How'd you get into this? I mean, did you have an aha moment in school somewhere that made you decide you wanted to go in this direction or these directions? Ah, uh, purely serendipitous. I mean, basically, I was an undergraduate at a university called Lancaster University in England, and my advisor was starting to look at some of the uh, pictures from the Apollo missions of the moon. And it seemed like an easy way to get a good grade in a course. Oh, and my God. I, and so from there, but there are all kinds of reasons that scientists go into science. <laughs> but, but honestly, I mean, um, just having so much fun doing uh, either it's field work or you're looking at these spectacular images or you're trying to put yourself on another planet, um, I, I never really thought about a career nor did I really think about where would be the most appropriate place to do the work. So I'm not a very good example of motivating uh, <laughs> young scientists to, to take up their passion and, and start a career. Um, I was just having fun. Yeah. So. Well, looking back, though, was it a good decision? Oh, well, I didn't even decide. I mean, I just fell into this by dumb luck. Sort of okay. And so, um, yeah, it, retrospectively, it, it's just wonderful that you, you get to do all these fun things 
as a geologist, I would go to see some active volcanoes, or I'd go to places like the Jet Propulsion Lab and see uh, flyby of Voyager tech that took uh, past Uranus, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's really stimulating kind of work, but there was never the intent, ah, if I do this, this, and this, then I would have a job, or I would be able to afford to live in Hawaii, or you could, any of that. I mean, it was just, uh, you know, from, from day one. It's, it's, it's a whole uh, life philosophy you're expressing. You know, you just let, let life carry you, and it will go in a good direction. Yes, but I mean, I've been really blessed that I've got a, a career or an interest that really lets me sort of develop uh, a, a number of research projects. Yeah. And for some bizarre reason, the university or the state values that kind of work in a way that lets me afford to live in Hawaii. So, you know, there, there's a catch-22. Uh, uh, the perfect many, intersection. It's a perfect <laughs> intersection. And I fully recognize that there are people way more talented than I in fields which unfortunately aren't as uh, uh, remunerated as well. Um, and I made no attempt to say, well, which career path gives you a, a livable salary or lets you go and travel and do all these other <laughs> exotic things. So I, I'm not a very good role model for people, but I was having fun all the time sort of thing. <laughs> you are a good role model. I disagree with that. <laughs> anyway, so we, we keep on referring back to Mars. And, and that means for me, you know, I mean, I, for example, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, right. I was, you know, introduced to that in the movie last week. That's right. That it played a big role. Can you talk about the movie? What did you think of the movie and the book? We're, t we're talking about The Martian, all right? The Martian. Uh, all right. So, um, fabulous movie. I mean, all, all of my colleagues and I, we always go and we, we look at a, a, a science fiction movie, whether it's The Martian or whether it's Gravity, or 2010 or whatever uh, and we 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 rank them both on an entertainment value as well as how close the science fact Fair enough. Are. and, and you know, we've, we've done courses for Hawaii teachers where we'll lead them through some of these movies to say this is wrong this is correct but anyway back to the Martian fabulous book the movie um, we can see they made a few changes or omissions which were necessary for the brevity of the film, but really great. I mean, Mark Watney uh, is it, just fantastic. I mean, he's so upbeat. Um, we know quite a few of the astronauts, the ones who went to the moon or rode on the space shuttle. His can-do attitude, the positive, all right, something's wrong, I'm going to fix it. That is really a very good portrayal of an astronaut, yeah. okay. Um, and you know, the, the main gripes we had were the landscape wasn't quite right, or um, that, you know, sort of uh, the sandstorms that they had. Oh, I heard the, that on NPR, and, yeah. yeah but, they don't have sandstorms like that in reality. Well, yeah. they have winds of that speed, but of course the density of the Martian atmosphere is so thin that, you know, you, you, even if you've got a 100 mile an hour wind, hurling particles at you, you'd still be able to stand up quite yeah, easily. Yeah, and yeah. they ignore things like solar radiation. That, that would have That'd killed be them. A problem. That yeah. would be a huge problem, particularly given the amount of time Watney spent outside the spacecraft. Uh, you, know, you, you would have a severe case of radiation sickness. Mm. Radiate like, like a bomb. Yeah, I mean, particularly if there was a, a solar flare while he was outside and you'd have no way of knowing when solar flares were coming because he was in poor communication with the Earth. Is, is there a way to protect yourself from radiation like that? Yeah, hide. <laughs> Preferably <laughs> under a few meters of rock would okay, be good. Okay, got it. Uh, I, uh, and, you know, uh, people have speculated that when we send astronauts either to the moon again or onto Mars, uh, they might actually want to hide in lava tubes, just like the lava tubes we have here on the Big Island, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that part of the movie um, didn't quite ring true. And as I said, some of the landscapes weren't really kosher, but it was a fabulous movie. And, and you know, um, uh, Andy Weir, who actually wrote the book, um, he put this as a blog um, that the, the book evolved. He's not a scientist. He's, well, he's an engineer. Okay. But 
the, the, he actually got a lot of input from the general public um, on how to solve some of the problems, you know, not just the uh, sort of growing potatoes, <laughs> but also public produ 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 producing the water <laughs> and that sort of thing. And so he got enough input from genuine scientists on, on how Watney could actually be doing the correct thing. So it, it rang very true. Um, you know, the book had a lot more uh, trials and tribulations than the movie, but both, both are fabulous. I mean, having seen that picture uh, from the Curiosity Rover Mount Shop, who wouldn't want to be on Mars? Yeah. I mean, what, what bugged me, though, was that uh, Watney didn't take any pictures. You know, he did this 3,000 kilometer long traverse to get to the Aries 4 takeoff place. Yeah. And he wasn't doing any science. And so you think back to what, say, Scott or Amazon did when they went to the South Pole in the early 20th century. You know, Scott, in particular, it was a scientific expedition for him. What he just went straight on by. You know, it's quite likely no human would go there for another century, sort of thing. You know, what, what a waste! <laughs> yeah. What a waste. And they could have insinuated that in the movie so easily. Oh yeah. Just, just have yeah. him take some pictures. Just have <laughs> Just have him take some pictures, or you know, he obviously wouldn't pick up samples because he was weight limited. But yeah, you know, just doing some panoramas. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, did you ever think, Peter, that um, one day you're going to get a call from Hollywood, and they're going to say, uh, uh, Dr. McGinnis, Mark, we we need we need some data on how to do this movie, and there's nobody finer in terms of the geology anyway than you. Uh, <laughs> oh, there are definitely people much better than I. Um, and historically, you know, sort of part of my career has introduced me to a lot of real volcanologists, like the, the guys who work at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory on the Big Island. For Don example. Thomas. Uh, I, I was thinking more, um, yeah, here, here's a nice picture of a, a lava flow, for example. Yeah. Um, Tina Neal, who's the scientist in charge at HVO right now, okay. you know, she, yeah. she was there when Mauna Loa was erupting like crazy in March of 1984. She did a lot of great science there. Um, and it turns out that some of her colleagues, Jack Lockwood in particular, has been um, a consultant for some of these really terrible volcano movies which have appeared over the last few years. And yet Jack would make the point that, you know, no, this is how the volcano erupts, and this is some of the products which you would get, and this is the event. So um, I, I would be hesitant even to serve as a, uh, a, a technical consultant for one of the, the planetary movies, because where the scientist really doesn't play a role is what might be entertaining or what might make the, the movie storyline flow along. I mean, it would, be, it would be frustrating <laughs> to have spent all the time and then just sort of discovered it. What about his ability to grow food on Mars? That seemed like uh, quite, quite a, uh, uh, an achievement, at least in the movie. Could um, it be done? Yes, I mean, this, this is one of the things where, you know, so far, no real food has been grown on the space station apart from lettuce or something like that. Um, and on the assumption that Mission Control had packed real potatoes. Seeds. No, he, he, oh, took, potatoes, he right, took real right. potatoes yeah. and cut them up and, and tried to grow them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not a botanist, but from the people I hear from, yes, that should be possible. That sort of thing, uh, and you know things like uh, what he was doing to create water and, and and fuel, and you know the amount of time it was taking him uh, to generate enough power to tr uh, get the rover going, and the the cold uh, he compensated for with the thermonuclear plant. And, you know that that all rang true. That that was pretty good, much better than the some of the other science fiction movies. So hats off to the producers, it was, yeah. Uh, but you know, the popularity of the movie, I mean, I, I, it's making a lot of money. It's, it's number yeah. one or something. But uh, the popularity of the movie to the public now, not the science community, the public, is the innovation. He's like a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. He's loaded with innovation. He's, as you said, problem solving. He's gonna solve every problem. And it's that kind of thing that appeals to people. 
whether it's accurate scientifically or not. Yeah, I think is, it is the can-do kind of attitude that, yeah. you know, you, 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 whether you're exploring the West or, you know, it's like the Polynesian explorers when they came to Hawaii, you know, you, you have to solve these problems yeah. or you die. Yeah. And Matt Damon's character, Mark Watney, he's just brilliant at that. And it really rings true with how most of the astronauts really operate. You know, most of them don't want to have major anomalies like he went through. But in comparison to, say, Sandra Bullock in Gravity, where you know, she went ballistic and you know, it, it, great CGI movie, but on the other hand, um, the responses that the astronauts would give weren't quite as genuine as, say, the, in The Martian yeah. and Mark one. So that's good. it's a good trend anyway. Oh, yeah, well, if they make more movies, I'm not <laughs> sure uh, what they would do uh, as a sequel for The Martian. I mean, so it would be a little hard to put him back there on the, the surface again, but... Uh, well, we, we can talk yeah. about that after the break. Okay. And sort of put the fiction together with the reality and see what happens. Uh, it's Peter McGinnis Mark, researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Um, we're learning so much about mm, the intersection of, of fiction and, and scientific fact. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I host Sustainable Hawaii every Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. My guests offer insights on challenging economic and environmental issues facing our state and offer innovative solutions to increasing Hawaii's long-term sustainability. Recently, we've been focusing on sustainable land development, food, and energy security. If you have a project or issue you'd like to discuss on the show or would like to be a guest, please contact me at kirstenbturner at gmail.com and tune in live weekly or view the show at your convenience at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. We're back. We're live. You know, if you were there on, that, on the surface of Mars and you look at that light-colored material, uh, as a geologist, and you felt it under your feet, you, you'd be able to identify the options of how it got to be like that. And just as every element in the universe is on the periodic table, every chemical, right, every physical phenomenon is also, we know what it is, we just make a list of the options. Wow. And pick one. I, a, a, a geologist could have various skills. I mean, you can have a geologist who would look at the mineralogy or the, the chemistry. Out in the field, actually, the sorts of things you would do, you've got these light layers, all right? And what you would try and do is to look at the particles that form up the layers. You know, are they cemented together? Are they of uniform size? It's just like if you go out to Hanama Bay, all right, at the Lanai Lookout, there is this wonderful set of exposures of, of ash which came from Coco Crater in an explosive volcanic eruption about 200,000 years ago. And what you would do is you'd go and look at each one of these layers, see if all the particles were the same size, whether they're stuck together or not, whether there's any grading as you move up or down. So a, what I would do if I was to climb Mount Sharp wouldn't be to worry about the chemistry or the minerals as a starting point, I would want to know what kind of particles are contained within. Are they windblown dust? Are they lake sediments? Are they volcanic ash? If it's volcanic ash, are they welded together? Do you see, like you do when you go up Tantalus, for example, a lot of the ash on Tantalus, just the, you know, back in Makiki, was produced by explosive eruptions. And we had like six meters of ash in downtown Honolulu. 80,000 years ago. And what you try and do is you look for, are they big particles, are they the tiny ones? Are they stuck together? Did they get remobilized with water? So there's a, a bunch of things I would do as, say, someone, if I was lucky enough to be walking on Mount Sharp, that's what I would look for, as opposed to worrying about, you know, how much silica have I got in the rock, or, or, or did this, uh, represent a new mineral or anything like mm -hmm. that. I, I'm more into the physical processes of it. So. Well, couldn't, couldn't the, uh, now the, the trip to Mars coming, what, in a year or two? It's coming soon. Well, there's a new spacecraft called InSight, which will get launched to Mars next year. Next yes. year. Right. And, and, and That's boring. That just doesn't go anywhere. 
Oh, sorry. Okay, well, <laughs> I just wonder, I mean... It's, um, it's, it's, and my boss <laughs> is involved in that, so that's why I'm saying this boring. <laughs> but is, is it possible that a spacecraft like that could pick up some of this material and bring it back to you? That's an unmanned, an unmanned voyage, uh, right? Yes. There's no human beings on that, so they can't walk on Mount Sharp the way you like cannot, to. They cannot, no. Uh, even if they got close enough to it. Um, but could they bring back, could a spacecraft and a robot bring back enough material material from uh, Sharp Mountain to satisfy and to let you make a good guess on what happened? Actually, um, you, you probably could answer some of the leading questions that I would have with the rover that's currently on the surface of Mars because it has a microscopic imager, because it has a number of uh, spectrometers, like you had Shiv Sharma here last week. Shiv does Raman spectroscopy. There's a, a, spec a Raman spectrometer on board the Curiosity rover. The key thing would then be you've got to be virtually up against the side of the, uh, the, the layers. Hard to get there. Hard to get to, but you know, if the rover it, it's got a nuclear power plant, it could last for another five or ten years, it's possible it will get to the lower elevations. But mm. before we go to yes, you've, got, the picture you've got to show the, the picture. this picture of the comet, okay. because there it this, is. This, this is, it, it, it's a bizarre world. What we're actually looking at, this is an image of the, the nucleus of comet 67 PC. All right, it's about, oh, 30 kilometers. So we imagine that the, the, the long axis of this comet would go from Hanama Bay to Crouching Lion on, on the windward side, right? And we're looking, although it looks as if it's in two pieces, it's actually all one single cometary nucleus, right? We, Even though they're not touching. They are touching, but it's in deep shadow. Well. And to their cr immense credit, the European Space Agency sent the Rosetta spacecraft to orbit this particular cometary nucleus early last year. And amazingly, they put a lander down on the surface of this comet, OK? And they got radio signals back. This is beyond the orbit of Mars, OK? And they've got the nucleus of a comet, which, as you can see in the image, all of that white fuzzy stuff it's degassing like crazy. So that's what's forming the tail of a comet as it gets closer to the sun. They were able to put a spacecraft called Rosetta in orbit around this cometary nucleus and then put a lander called Philae down on the surface. And this is the sort of thing which inspires me. I mean, the, the images of Pluto, the image of Mount Sharp on, on Mars, this image from Rosetta of you know, a completely different part of the solar system. You, this is made out of frozen water ice. It's got a density of about 0.6. As right. opposed to? As opposed to rock would be about three and a half to five or something like that. So, you know, uh, this would float in a bucket of water if you had a large enough bucket, for example. So it's light. It's light and it's low density. And, you know, it probably dates from the real earliest episodes of the solar system's history. We thought the surface of Pluto would be just like that, but Pluto is completely different. So you, know, you have all these um, different parts of the solar system where, you know, thanks to spacecraft and some of our grad students or, or whomever, has, have built these wonderful instruments that you now can start or trying to understand, well, how does a planet actually evolve over time? Is the Earth unique? Would you expect to find other habitable worlds around other stars? Uh, what is the likely history of the solar system if you've got these objects flying around? You know, what is the consequence of two of them colliding with each other? And that, that's the sort so, of... So what kind of questions would you, would you ask the comet? What would you what would you learn from the comet yeah, as opposed apart to from what's your name and where do you <laughs> yeah, come from? What's your, <laughs> your code number? You know, but you know, you, you say you you get much more excited by the comet than you do by Mars or Pluto. No, Pluto and, and the comet are on par with each okay, other. Okay, fair enough. Because it's so different 
from anything things we don't know anything we've previously seen all right pluto we probably won't go back there in our lifetimes unfortunately um, the comet we might be able to catch another one but in each case you know it, it's just totally bizarre you know, to see how the tail of the comet is being formed by these blasts of water vapor that freezes as soon as it reaches the surface for example and yet there's areas of the comet which really seem to be almost pristine and bruce willis uh in, in what was deep impact or something like that yeah it wasn't that bizarre it turned out we thought it was just a crazy movie but yeah there's so much relief on this cometary nucleus so mars uh, sort of, uh, it is certainly a good world where people could potentially land one day that's what i wanted to ask you about you know in that movie they talk about days you know and so hither and yon, what, three years or so, you get 50 million miles, and you can go there and do what he did. You can right. live in a... Uh, uh, in in a, a dome thing. of some sort, yes. Yeah. And you can play out all the science fiction we've ever heard about living on foreign right. planets and, and maybe, maybe saving humanity on a foreign planet when Earth goes bust. Who knows what? You know, but is there really a chance, Peter? I don't know. I won't say our <laughs> lifetimes, because I think... It's not going to be our lifetimes, but maybe, you know, maybe you'd say it was. Is there really a chance that, that humankind will actually, you know, uh, uh, populate these places, colonize them, if you will, and go to, you know, you said Pluto was a lot further, a lot smaller. Maybe that's harder than, but is there really a chance that we will live in these domes and uh, survive there? Is that uh, I, it, it depends on what time frame you're thinking of. I mean, we won't do it in our lifetimes, okay? Uh, to, to, to live there permanently. But you could have, say, a permanently occupied lunar base um, by 2040, maybe even 2035, something like that. Um, but to have separate colonies where you know, the people aren't coming back to Earth, partly it's going to be an economic problem that you know, these things are not cheap to, to even conceptualize. Um, and you know, if you really want to make it self-sustaining, you've got to put a lot more infrastructure in than you would in comparison, say, like Scott Base or, or South Pole Base in Antarctica, where it's resupplied um, from you know, lower latitudes. It's a lot right? harder so, to resupply Mars. So it's, it's a lot harder to resupply Mars sort yeah. of thing. But you know, it depends on the imperative. Uh, or you know, political will political to, to fund yeah, these sorts yeah, of things. And, and yeah. But they, they, they are not cheap, and you know, it's possible that private sector might take up uh, some of the uh, opportunities for like asteroid mining um, to, to look for rare earth elements and that sort of thing. Um, but populating Mars simply as a way of alleviating population explosion on Earth is <laughs> not viable. No, no, you, know, no, you no. can't. There's no that. atmosphere to speak of. And yeah, uh, and, and although there's liquid water close to the surface during the summer at times and a lot of ice underneath the surface, you know, you'd have a lot of problems in terms of just being sustainable in, in any reasonable lifestyle sort of thing. Yeah, but you think about these things. All the, the job. Yeah. All the time. All the time. I mean, I'll, I'll stare at that, ma that image of Mount Sharp and you just, why can't I just be walking across that surface? I mean, there's so many things I would like to get resolved just in that one image sort of thing. So it's fascinating. Stuff. It is enviable. Peter McGinnis, Peter, Peter McGinnis Mark, researcher, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, HIGP and in SOAS, the School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology, and in the NASA Pacific Regional Planetary Data Center, and in the UH Manoa Sustainability Initiative. Thanks for coming down, Peter. My pleasure, Jay. Great to see you. Thank you, yes. Till next time, right? Till next time. We'll be Very good. soon. Take care. Thanks. <laughs>